Shalom from Jerusalem. Four days into the war Hamas launched against Israel, the basic premise underlying the deliberations at the IDF Tel Aviv Underground Command Post, often hosting Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Yav Gallant, is that more fronts will follow. The prime candidate is, of course, Hezbollah in Lebanon, but it could also envelop Syria, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Arab communities in Israel proper. Moreover, it could also escalate into war with Iran. What are the realistic prospects of a multi-sector war? To help us analyze it, we're joined all the way from London, the United Kingdom, by Colonel or retired Colonel Joel Rayburn, who is the former U.S. Special Envoy to Syria, as well as under Assistant Secretary of uh, State for the Levant. Thank you for joining us, Colonel. My also join Indeed, also joining us uh, from Central Israel is retired Colonel Dr. Eran Lerman, uh, who is uh, a TV7 Powers in Play uh, co-panelist, the Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, uh, as well as uh, the former Israeli Deputy National Security Council Director. Thank you for joining us as well, sir. Thank you. And with me here in the studio is, of course, TV7 editor-at-large, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, give, give us a broader understanding of the current state of affairs and the prime question, what are the prospects for a multi-sector war? So, as you remember, um, in August of 1914, nobody said, here we are starting the First World War. In June 1967, Israel didn't say, okay, this is the first day of the Six-Day War. And we can go even uh, uh, back to the 30 years war and the 100 years war and all of that. Uh, this is by way of saying that what now uh, looks like the Israel-Hamas war may turn out uh, to be something else altogether. It could very well turn out to be a multi-front, multi-sector war. Uh, this is uh, not uh, uh, predetermined. We shouldn't look at it uh, in a fatalistic way. But it could happen uh, when the um, next phase of the uh, Israeli uh, counterattack into Gaza turns into a ground war. Uh, Hezbollah may decide, or may be directed by Iran, to launch its own war against Israel. And if that happens, Israel may decide that this is the uh, best opportunity to strike at Iran and not only respond to Hezbollah. So um, we are at a very uh, delicate, fragile time where it could either escalate, which is probably why the United States sent its uh, Sixth Fleet Task Force towards the Eastern Mediterranean, or it could uh, simply uh, die down with uh, a ceasefire um, formula, uh, which could include, should include, the release of all the hostages held by Hamas. Uh, Dr. Lerman, I'd like to start with you, actually. I'd like to ask uh, you, as the editor-in-chief of uh, the Jerusalem Strategic Tribune, uh, were you to provide a headline for this month's edition, uh, would prospects of a multi-sector war be a candidate title for that? Um, frankly, I think the um, likelihood is still less than even, although the, the threat is there, the danger is there, and the IDF is on full mobilization for this reason. You don't need 300,000 uh, being called up for uh, the southern front to deal with Hamas. This is uh, uh, first and foremost to uh, create a deterrent posture in the north while uh, uh, leaving Israel's hands free to operate in the south in the full uh, and bring the full measure of consequences to Hamas for what uh, most Israelis have come to perceive as a Nazi style slaughter of our citizens. Um, so the question now revolves around deterrence, and I would say uh, um, penalty and deterrence would be uh, my title. Uh, penalty for Hamas and deterring uh, Hezbollah and its Iranian uh, uh, puppet masters uh, from uh, getting in. Interestingly, 
Um, the United States, and uh, as of yesterday, um, also France, Germany, Britain, and Italy have spoken to this question and said that this would be a mistake or it would be uh, um, wrong headed for other hostile parties <clears throat> to get into the war. And the American deployment is clearly in this context. Whether or not the administration cares to admit that Iran was involved in planning uh, the Hamad, the Tufan al Aqsa, the Al Aqsa flood um, barbarity, um, I think that it, it, the intelligence assessment is that Iran is behind it to some extent. But now the mission is to deter them from getting in. Now, Hezbollah is Iran's most important asset. And they have been keeping it against the possibility of Israeli action against their nuclear capabilities. For them to actually waste it on, uh, on behalf of saving Hamas uh, from the preordained fate um, doesn't actually serve an Iranian interest. And so I, I, I still think, although it can easily deteriorate into an all-out uh, multi-front uh, situation, I still think that ultimately if they calculate their, uh, their chances and their uh, costs in Iran, um, they will not push Hamas, uh, 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 Hezbollah to, uh, to risk their survival on behalf of Hamas. Uh, Colonel Rayburn, when we're looking at the current USS uh, Gerald R. Ford uh, Joint Strike Group going through the Adri uh, Adriatic Sea towards uh, the shores of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, with a uh, declared intention uh, by the United States to deter, to uh, gather intelligence and to uh, conduct uh, maritime dominance, uh, obviously, uh, there are two sides to the sword uh, with uh, those statements obviously directed uh, towards the Islamic Republic of Iran, as was mentioned here, as well as to the Lebanese Iranian proxy Hezbollah. Uh, to what degree do you see a follow through or a follow up uh, to this deployment uh, in order to ensure that if Iran does act, uh, there are going to be far-reaching ramifications that even this regime will not survive? Well, uh, the United States has the problem right now um, that it has had to make a sharp pivot in its military posture to deploy the further forces to, to uh, try to deter uh, the Iranian regime from taking the further step, as you mentioned, of opening a northern front in order to relieve what's going to be very severe pressure on Hamas. Now, in order for that to work, the message, the warning that those forces would act uh, if it came to it has to be credible. It has to be credible. It, it, the, the Supreme Leader, Hassan Nasrallah and other decision makers have to believe the warning. Uh, on, in order for that warning to be believed, the United States has to do some further things that are not military. Uh, for example, they're going to need to do things like discontinue the de facto sanctions relief that the Biden administration has, has been allowing since early 2021, which has allowed the Iranian regime to uh, net a big uh, oil revenue windfall of perhaps as much as $50 billion in excess oil revenue had the, uh, that they've gotten, had the, uh, that they wouldn't have had had the sanctions actually been enforced. They've got to discontinue. They really need to refreeze the, the funds that they just unfroze and allowed to go to a country bank in exchange for the South Korean funds that were uh, part of the hostage exchange and so on. And they need to break off uh, all of the diplomatic engagement that they've been doing, even behind the scenes in Oman and so on, whether it's over the, the question of hostages or de-escalation or a return to the nuclear agreement. They, they need to show that they are abandoning the detente path, the, the basically a redux of the Obama administration path. Otherwise, I think that there's uh, the, the warning um, of a military deterrent won't be credibly received. And then the risk of a miscalculation on the Iranian and, and the Hezbollah side uh, is going to be high. I, I think um, I'm a little bit different from uh, from our colleague because 
I think that the Iranian regime will use Hezbollah. They just won't use Hezbollah to, to open a northern front. They just won't do it in Lebanon. They'll do it in a sort of a, in a deniable way next door in Syria. Uh, that's why they've spent several years. That's why Qasem Soleimani, you know, may he rest in peace, worked so hard to establish those strategic outposts in Syria which for exactly this moment. Yeah, maybe he rose to be. Soleimani and the Iranian regime invested so heavily, they've taken so many losses from the Israeli Air Force to try to keep moving those strategic weapons into Syria for exactly this moment. And so the, I, I don't think it's likely that they would leave them unused. Beyond that, uh, the Iranian regime, has the Quds Force has been working very hard to, esta to establish another potential front over in Iraq where they have even more expendable uh, proxies over there in, in the in the Shia militant groups, and those could be used against U.S. presence, or it could be used uh, for missile launches against, uh, against uh, uh, Israel, I, either one. So I think that's how it's more likely to unfold. So it's still in a in a in a window of, of great danger, in my view. There is a lot of discussion about uh, what instigated, actually, this whole uh, brutal attack by the Islamist Hamas uh, with Iranian fingerprints, whether it likes to admit it or not. Uh, we heard, obviously, as we mentioned also earlier today, uh, and provided some uh, evidence on TV7 Israel News prior to this airing uh, that uh, the Iranians are uh, trying to distance themselves uh, from uh, any involvement in this matter because they know this could also cost them the regime, uh, for that matter. Uh, and therefore, uh, there is a question about Iraqi, uh, excuse me, Qatari and Iranian uh, interests, uh, particularly with regard to foiling or preventing uh, a normalization accord between Israel and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia that would have once again allowed Saudi and uh, the Emiratis to uh, re-emerge as the dominant force in the region uh, in the face of, of uh, those nations, uh, which is obviously a reality that they do not want. Uh, nevertheless, to broaden the discussion that we're currently having, I'd like to focus on the Iraqi aspect, which uh, uh, Colonel Rayburn just mentioned, and the fact that there have been deployments of Hashta Shabi, the Popular Mobilization Forces, an alliance of 44 militias, the majority of which are Iranian proxies, uh, trained, equipped, and financed by the Islamic Republic of Iran, its Revolutionary Guard Quds Force, and uh, was uh, orchestrated uh, also by Qasem Soleimani at the time, who was uh, thankfully eliminated in an American drone attack. When you see this amassing troops, and there is discussions about weaponry being diverted through Jordan into the so-called West Bank uh, by uh, Iranian militias with uh, Jordan's Mahabharat, which is controlling the territory with an iron fist on the intelligence front, allowing this to occur. Is this also a certain reality that is being discussed? Well, the Jordanian angle uh, is surprising. If what uh, you just uh, reported is true, uh, it means uh, that King Abdullah II uh, has decided that he doesn't trust Israel and that he wants to foment uh, some uh, subversion, insurgency in the West Bank. Um, and uh, this, this would be um, quite a change. But the, um, as for, for what you asked regarding Iraq, uh, at the risk of impeding our discussion, the short answer is we don't know. And this goes back to the whole question of the intelligence failure, um, both the uh, Israeli and the American failure, which perhaps just like in late September and early October of 1973 um, had at least uh, partly to do with the Americans regal uh, relying on the expertise of the Israelis because the Israeli intelligence, especially military intelligence, uh, where Aran Lerman uh, rose uh, in the ranks uh, and was a senior assessor um, years ago. Iran had nothing to do with this uh, failure. Nevertheless, uh, we were considered the um, uh, experts uh, on, on this particular matter. And this is important because decision makers cannot trust intelligence as they did only a few days ago. 
And if that is the case, they may either risk or decide not to risk their next policy move. So it is not just uh, a blame game. It has to do with decisions which are on the table today. Dr. Lerman? Well, um, on the assumption that Conrad Rayburn is right and Hezbollah would rather avoid a confrontation uh, from its ho- their home base in Lebanon, not least because Lebanon has become so fragile that no one wonders if it can actually sustain the consequences of an Israeli onslaught. Uh, then the scenario uh, in, southern, uh, in southern Syria could perhaps be attractive, but the uh, flip side of that coin is that, of course, the capabilities that they can bring to bear are marginal uh, as compared to the immense uh, missile arsenal that sits in Lebanon itself. And so that would be something that Israel could probably handle um, uh, without uh, uh, being distracted significantly from its main course. The same, I would say, from, for uh, missile attacks from uh, the uh, militias in Iraq or even uh, from the Houthi um, uh, element that has proven its capacity for long-range uh, launches. But uh, these, are, it would be, these would be uh, issues for Israel's uh, missile defense systems to uh, respond to. And uh, Israel, we, we, this, this can be handled. However, uh, being drawn into a full-scale confrontation with Lebanon is a very different matter. And I believe that um, the Israeli uh, defense establishment uh, would prefer to, uh, not to jump on that opportunity, but actually to avoid it Uh, use our still formidable deterrent posture, augmented by an American deterrent um, positioning to to keep that flank um, more or less under control while we go uh, to to our next mission. Indeed. Colonel Rayburn, your take? Uh, Well, I wonder, so... The unanswered question is how far uh, the Iranian regime uh, would be willing to go in order to prevent the uh, permanent destruction of Hamas. That's that's a question we don't know uh, the the answer to. Would they, in the end, be willing to open up a, a Lebanon-Israel front uh, if, if it if it came to that? Uh, I'm not I'm not sure. I don't know what their calculations are. Uh, if it does come, let let's say if it does come to a, a major confrontation, though, uh, between Israel and Hezbollah, and by extension, the Iranian regime, it seems to me that uh, there would be three ways to destroy Hezbollah by, militarily. The first is frontally, head on. Uh, the second is to take out their, uh, their patron or to, or to you know, seriously wound their patron the, directly, the Iranian regime. Or the middle way would be to uh, to destroy, mortally wound, or or ser- seriously wound, uh, the linchpin between them, the Assad regime, uh, Bashar al-Assad and his top military leadership. The, the the link between the Iranian regime and Hezbollah relies on on uh, them being there in power and capable, and they're the weak link in the chain. And that's been that's been the case for a while. It would have been wise, I think, in peacetime. Uh, to to try to break that link through non-war means. That's one of the things that I was trying to do uh, in my capacity in the in the U.S. government by using economic pressure and political isolation and and so on. Uh, th- that that path wasn't followed for the last two and a half years, but now that it's come to now that it's come to it, I think it still remains a fact that the Assad regime is the weak link in the axis of resistance chain. And that's probably something that Israeli strategists and planners are, are looking at as we speak. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Olin. Let, let me bring up um, an alternative theory um, just for the sake of discussion. It may or may not uh, uh, seem uh, feasible. If uh, Israel has up to now decided not to go into Gaza to reconquer Gaza and get bogged down for, who knows, two years, three years, five years. 
maybe uh, if you look at it from the uh, Iranian point of view, Hamas is expandable. It's Sunni. Um, better for the Iranians that Israel goes into Gaza and is uh, left uh, to its uh, devices there. And Iran has a freer hand. So um, Iran would uh, certainly uh, not uh, uh, jump uh, immediately to the rescue of Hamas. Uh, Iran uh, would uh, cold-heartedly do its own uh, calculations. And maybe uh, if it watches the Israeli ground campaign into Gaza get bogged down, it will um, keep cheering from uh, the stands. Well, it seems like, we, uh, at this stage at least, a sixth of all of Gaza is already destroyed and we haven't even started yet. So uh, we'll see whether or not there is going to be first and foremost international pressure, which uh, the Qatari, um, uh, obviously we see Al Jazeera and the various uh, engines that they have are already spreading a lot of disinformation throughout uh, various medias in the West to try and already ratchet up pressures on governments to be more wary and, and demand Israeli uh, um to, uh, to rein back Israel at least somewhat, or are we going to see potentially... No, but, uh, I'm, I'm looking at it from the other side. Better for Iran uh, that Israel goes into Gaza and Israel has Gaza on its hand the way um, it uh, stayed in Lebanon for 18 years. Uh, this is um, a plus for Iran, not a minus. Uh, an Israeli... Uh, involvement in the um, Gaza Kmogmire. Well, uh, the Ayatollah regime has the suggestion of our editor at large, no, Mr. Not, Amir no Oven, um, let us destroy Hamas and be done with it. Dr. Lehrman, your take on this? Well, quite, quite frankly, um, the rational calculations as to the cost-benefit analysis of whether or not Hamas is better deterred or better dead um, have been superseded by a very profound sense um, within a very broad segment of Israeli society from left to right that the, uh, their continued existence as they are in the Gaza Strip has become intolerable. And uh, we need to be very, uh, very clear about this. I used the term earlier and I'll go back to it. Um, what we witnessed was not simply a terror attack. And it was certainly not the kind of missile damage that we've sort of grown used to. What we saw on the 7th of October was the massive uh, butchery of Jews for being Jews. Well, they also killed Arabs because they were somewhat indiscriminate, but uh, they killed uh, men, a good number of Bedouin Arabs in the Negev. But they killed, they were slaughtering Jews for being Jews. They were abusing and taking away children. Um, the cord of reminiscence going back to the Holocaust has been touched in the hearts of Israelis and the penalty for being, not doing Nazi things is the Nazi consequence, namely the elimination of Hamas as a governing authority and the elimination of its leadership. And with all the tragic consequences that may follow, this uh, belongs to a very different template. This is what Israel is for, so that things like that will not be done again to Jews with impunity. And therefore, um, whether or not this would make uh, uh, Tehran happy or not is by now be fairly much beside the point. The question is, can is how, to what an extent can Israel sustain its freedom of action? Uh, while deterring Hezbollah and the Iranians from uh, from uh, uh, making our life much more complicated and and uh, bringing us into a war of much greater intensity, as I said, I think we have a be somewhat better than even chance of doing that with international support, but uh, it is not a certain thing in any way. I, th I think it's very important to highlight the fact that. 14 Americans were also murdered. We had Germans, we had Brits, we had people from all throughout Europe that were brutally murdered in this massacre, which could be called the October Massacre at this stage. But uh, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Uh, Colonel Rayburn, 
when you look at the, the current scheme of things, how do you see the next couple of days evolve in, in the current rapidly evolving environment? Well, I, I think it, you know, it seems to me, look, I, I'm, I'm not an Israeli, but it seems to me that in line with what Aaron said, that, that uh, uh, the military objective of the operation in Gaza has to be the destruction of Hamas as, as a threat and as a governing authority permanently. And that's going to lead to uh, the, the kind of operation that's going to be very difficult. It's going to be a massive ground operation. There's going to be an international backlash, uh, which is going to be fueled by Israel's enemies and the United States enemies. Uh, and it's, there's going to be a lot of international political pressure uh, on behalf of, of Hamas and the Iranian regime to try to stop that. Uh, but I think that probably uh, you're going to have the support Uh, from Washington that will give you top cover for that. If I can touch though, Jonathan, on the on the Iranian on Iranian you intentions. You have thirty seconds. I think, I think okay. I, I think Supreme Leader Khamenei is an old man in a hurry, and I I think that he he has a lifelong of objective of checkmating Israel, of establishing a, a North Korea versus Seoul kind of existential threat against Israel that he can use not just against Israel but by extension against the United States. I think in that regard, Hamas is an asset that he will not want to see uh, uh, wasted. And Hamas also is not just a threat to Israel. Hamas, if it establishes a model and a capability, is a threat to all of the surrounding Arab states because they're a Muslim Brotherhood radical model that has a lot of sympathizers on the street in the Arab world. And that's something that will be a huge asset uh, to the Supreme Leader. I think this is a very important point. And uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, the United States support, which currently is in question, uh, for Egypt, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who has designated the Muslim Brotherhood uh, as a terrorist organization, uh, should be uh, reconsidered. It should be, uh, there should be support for Egypt. That, that's the bottom line, because it's also a stabilizing force in this region to contend also with the Islamist Hamas. But this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Colonel Rayburn and Dr. Lerman for being part of today's panel. I'd like to thank Mr. Ogan as well. Shalom from me here in Jerusalem. Until tomorrow, when we'll have a series of additional updates as well. <laughs>